All right, we're going to talk about electric generators. To start off, let me show you a demonstration of a hand cranked generator. You can buy a generator for your bicycle where you attach uh, a small, looks like a little motor, and then there's a little wheel that spins against the side of your, your tire and generate electricity to power your uh, light at night, your bike at night. And now, nowadays, they don't worry about these fancy ways of generating electricity, but in the old days, that's what we used to do. This is also a generator. I'm going to turn this crank and generate a current in this uh, bulb. OK, so what's happening here? This is actually hard to turn. And the reason is that there are coils of wire in here and magnets. And there's a change in flux in the coils of wire that is produced by the turning motion of the coils. And through Faraday's law, the change in flux through a coil of wire generates a current in the wire. And that's the current you see in the bulb here. So a generator, there's one of these in your car. It's called an alternator because it has some extra gadgets. But at the very heart, it's a generator. You've got the motion of your wheels of your car that generates a current that charges your battery. OK. We've talked about motors in previous chapters. And what do motors do? They convert electrical energy into mechanical energy. So we're going to take some current and, and run it through a motor. and that that we use that to, while well, we have a battery, whatever battery pack in our, in our remote control car, that motor powers the wheels of the car. A generator does just the opposite. It converts mechanical energy, such as the motion of the wheels in your car, and converts that mechanical energy into electrical energy. So what you want with your alternator in your car is to charge a battery. You need some current to charge it. And it's your generator slash alternator that does that. So it's the rotation of a coil by some external agent. Um, so in wind turbines, for example, it's the wind that turns the, the fan blades. And then that motion is used to generate electricity. Or a turbine um, in in a waterfall, you got water passing through these fan-shaped um, uh, propeller-like things that, that turn the, these turbines, and that generates electricity. So the change in flux through the coil is produced by this external rotation. Some agency is causing something to turn, and then some agent, and then that induces an EMF and a current through the coil. So we're thinking about some external agent that turns this coil of wire about this, this axis. And then it's going to be in the presence of a magnetic field, say, between the north and south poles of a horseshoe magnet. And that changes the flux um, through this wire, through Faraday's law. And through, uh, well, it changes the flux, the magnetic flux, through the coil. And through Faraday's law, there's a current generated, an EMF and a current generated in the coil, which you can use to power your, uh, your lamp. So let me, uh, and so this is, this is the way that, that electric power is produced in, in power generating stations. Faraday's law of induction. It's also the principle behind a so-called PEG device, personal energy generator. It's a small device you can put in your backpack that uses Faraday's law of induction to convert the mechanical energy of your, your just movements. You're moving along with your backpack in your back, or you're going up some stairs or whatever. This, this jiggling motion um, 
changes the flux through a loop of wire which generates, induces a current which charges a battery in this device. And then you can use this device as a power source for your other mobile devices. So here's the, I think there's just one concept in this chapter. State the EMF induced in a rotating planar coil. This one's a bit of a mouthful, but if you have a coil that's being rotated at a constant velocity, a constant angular speed, this goes back to last semester where we talked about rotational motion. Omega here is the angular speed. It's measured in radians per second. It's like a linear speed, but it's, we're talking about how fast it's rotating now. And that's equal to 2 pi times the frequency. You might recall that from last semester as well. This is a great review for, for last semester, where f is the frequency of rotation measured in hertz, both from last semester. n is the number of loops in the coil. That always appears. That one shows up in um, Faraday's law minus, in Faraday's law, the e, the script e, is minus n times change in flux divided by the change in time. That's why this number of um, loops appears in there. Magnetic field, you can't, get a, you can't get an EMF generated without a magnetic field. Area of the coil is related to the magnetic flux. B times A times the cosine of the angle between is the uh, magnetic flux. So ultimately, we've got an AC EMF generated in this coil that's given by omega, the angular speed, NBA, National Basketball Association, whatever. You think of it however you want. Is the number of turns in the uh, coil, B times A reminds you a lot of the magnetic flux. And then finally, sine of omega T, which reminds you of that cosine phi, but in this case, this is a time-dependent um, EMF generated by this turning coil. So if we were to plot the script E as a function of time, then it's going to look like a sine wave. Um, <coughs> when the sine's positive, the EMF is positive. When the sine, when the times are such that the sine is negative, the EMF is going to be negative. So it's, that is just an AC current. That's what we, what we measure or what we have in our, in our homes with the frequency of 60 hertz in that particular case. So in fact, if you were to rotate this with a frequency of 60 hertz, then you'd produce the same uh, frequency of of AC EMF that you have in your home. As, as I indicated in the demonstration with the hand crank generator, you don't get something for nothing, and we talked about this earlier. You have to put some effort into that generator to get some energy out of it. And this is the, the, the idea. When a motorator is, is operating, there's two sources of EMF that are present. First of all, the applied EMF that provides the current to drive the motor. And secondly, the in EMF induced by the generator action of the rotating coil. This is the back EMF. It's trying to oppose the motion. And so the current, uh, it's called a uh, back EMF, the current is going to be subject to both of those EMFs that are present. So here's a demonstration of this um, back EMF. This is a demonstration of eddy currents. I have here a piece of aluminum suspended on a, on a pendulum arm, and I have a powerful magnet, permanent magnet down here. It produces a magnetic field in this direction, and when this piece of aluminum enters that strong magnetic field region between the two poles of the magnet, the change in the flux 
the magnetic flux through this piece of aluminum induces an EMF in the aluminum and currents in the aluminum. And the direction of those can be determined by Lenz's law. If the magnetic field is in this direction, as the aluminum enters the magnetic field region, the magnetic flux is increasing. It's increasing in this direction. To oppose that increase, there are currents that go in this way that produce an induced magnetic field in the direction opposite the original magnetic field. And that opposes, that works out, th those actual currents produce a force that opposes the, uh, the actual motion of this aluminum plate. So what you'd be looking for is to see that the, whereas normally this would have oscillated uh, without much friction for a long time, when allowed to pass through the magnetic field, the force is quickly, or the, the motion is quickly damped out. Center that a little bit better. That's called eddy braking. It's used a lot in um, amusement park rides, actually, to slow down amusement park uh, uh, cars in, in roller coasters, etc. Now, with this piece of aluminum, we've got slits cut into it. So those circular eddy currents are not, uh, this will prevent any eddy currents um, to be produced. So this one can oscillate for quite a good long time and, and be very happy. The, uh, the other thing to mention about this, this one, the solid piece of aluminum, is that not only do you get breaking as it enters the magnetic field and as the magnetic flux is increasing through it, but you also get breaking as it exits the region of the magnetic field and you get currents in the opposite direction, both, the, both when entering and exiting, it tends to slow it down. So those are, that's eddy braking and um, one more example of Faraday's law. Okay, one more demonstration. This is another demonstration of eddy braking. This is an aluminum pipe, so it's a conducting pipe. It's hollow, about five feet long. This is a steel ball. If I drop it through the pipe, it falls under gravity with very little friction, maybe, little, maybe a little air friction as it moves through, but just uh, nothing too particularly interesting. This is a magnet. When I drop this into the pipe, it will change the magnetic flux through the pipe in the region where it's passing. So changing the magnetic flux through a conductor means you're going to generate an EMF and currents in that conductor. And according to Faraday and Lenz's law, those currents will act to oppose the change in magnetic flux. And so ultimately what happens is that the, there will be a force that retards the motion of this magnet through the tube. And what you're going to have to do is just wait uh, to see how long it takes for this um, magnet to pass through the tube. I felt it pass my hand. And that is magnetic braking. It's uh, used in maglev trains, and as we mentioned before, amusement um, park rides. Uh, Faraday, of course, never envisioned the um, uses to which his theories would be put uh, over time. He was just fascinated by the science. Okay, let's uh, put some mathematical flesh on the bones here. We talked about uh, the fact that in a a motor, we've got two EMFs going on, opposing each other. 
the EMF that generates the, the, the original effect and the back EMF generated by, by Lenz's law. The current through a motor driven by an applied EMF, V, is given by the difference between the applied EMF, V, and the back EMF generated by the rotating coil. So we take the applied minus the back EMF, divide by R, and that'll give us the resistance. This looks like V equals IR. Well, we've just replaced V with V minus E. And then we've just solved for the current I. And R is the resistance of the coil. So that's all there is to that. Um, current is V minus E divided by R. And that allows you to actually calculate the current through a motor that's driven by an applied EMF. A uh, quick example, the coil of an AC motor has a resistance of 4.1 ohms. The motor is plugged into an outlet where the voltage is 120 volts, RMS. The coil develops a back EMF of 118 volts. When rotating at normal speed, the motor is turning a wheel. Find the current when the motor first starts up and the current when the motor is operating at normal speed. Well, when it first starts up, the um, the EMF is zero, so it hasn't yet generated that that back EMF. So 120 minus 4.1, we get 29 amps initially, was it's just starting up, whereas we only get a small amount of current <laughs> after it's. Um, the coil has developed its full back EMF of 118 volts RMS. So we've got 120 minus 118. And there's really no way you can get around this with motors. You've got to you try and design around it as best you can. Um, but that back EMF is an important consideration in the um, design of motors.